Good afternoon, everybody. This is Adrian Montgomery with ERP VAR. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to be talking about Stage 100 Cloud, Automated Procurement, Inventory Cycle Count, and Shipping. I'm so pleased to be joined by Fraction, Certipro, and Starship. A little bit about the speakers here. We have Scott Pace. He's the VP of Strategic Relations for Fraction. And Fraction is formally known as eRequester, so you may um, recognize eRequester. And then Third Pro Solutions, Simon Quinn, he's the sales manager over there, and Matt St. John, sales executive over at Starship. And just a little bit about the companies before we get started. Uh, Fraction, formerly eRequester, is a trusted and proven requisition PO and expense management solution. And they automate that those spend management processes for users and for Stage 100 Cloud specifically for this webinar. And it gives administrators and accounting the control to boost efficiency. And we're also joined by CertiPro Solutions. And CertiPro is a team of Sage certified developers. And they have dedicated software programmers that can design solutions specifically for Stage 100 Cloud, Stage 300 Cloud, Stage 500, and they also have X3 under their Stage belt. Uh, so thank you, Simon, for being here. And then uh, Matt with Starship, He'll, we will be talking about uh, Starship Stage goal development for integrated shipping solutions since 1989 for Stage 100 Cloud. Um, lots of established relationships with those warehouse solutions that integrate with Stage 100 Cloud. So like ScanCo, ScanForce for inventory management and TrueCommerce for EDI, SPF Commerce. Uh, so they have those integrations, those mature integrations that can grow with you in your Stage 100 Cloud solutions. And then just a little bit about the workflow. We're going to be talking about how uh, the purchasing requisition fraction solution ensures that your uh, the purchase orders and the requests are properly routed for review and approval. Um, that purchase purchasing managers can use mobile devices to increase that turnaround. That's so important for purchasing and. Uh, we're going to also show a detailed requisition dashboard, requisition templates, and requests for new vendors and more. Scott will be showing us that. And then we're also going to be talking about advanced inventory cycle counts, how Serta Pro integrates with those solutions like ScanCo, multi-bin warehouse management solutions that they can, it sets up the number of times to count items, it sends emails to counters, supports multiple warehouses for Stage 100, uh, and it also helps manage the inventory life cycle and how Starship will take all the details of the order, the dimensional weight of the package of the package being shipped. It eliminates that need for rekeying, rekeying of the data into carrier system and also will pick the best carrier based on all the rules of the shipment, cost, location of the customer, uh, and all those uh, details to get the best uh, rate for your shipment. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Scott to start it off with automating procurement. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you very much, Adrian, as well. I'm going to um, provide some overview information and then, of course, give you a little tour of our solution. Uh, thanks again for everybody joining today. I'm going to talk about how our fraction spend management solution, formerly called eRequester, works with Sage 100 Cloud to help companies provide better controls and efficiencies over spending. The system, Fraction eRequester, or Fraction E for short, it um, works with Sage 100. It helps um, sync the data back and forth so you don't have redundant data entry, and it provides controls and efficiencies over the purchasing workflow arenas at your organization. The solution is uh, created by our company called Fraction. We merged uh, Fraction and eRequester early in the year 
Uh, we've been in business for about 20 years. We are a longtime Sage Gold certified development partner, and we have over a thousand customers worldwide and tens of thousands of end users utilizing our fraction spend management solution. The system has uh, the ability to work for various industries. Most companies have to pay the bills. A lot of them do purchasing and a lot of them need controls over spending. As a result, our cu customers are in a great variety of different industries. A sample of some of our representative clients are illustrated here. We have clients in, in um, Germany. The NATO school uses our system with Sage 100, believe it or not, as well as uh, New York City Parks and Recreation. Uh, big companies and medium-sized small companies all use the system because it provides a nice, easy-to-use interface for getting approval to spend money. Uh, the kind of challenges that we are looking to address include companies that just have paper-based processes for uh, purchase requests. A lot of companies just do after the fact approvals of invoices. We can help address those needs as well. Uh, you can either get pre-approval to purchase, which is called like a purchase requisition, or you could do what we call check requests or payment requests and just get invoices or check requests approved and then vouchered to pay. And among the challenges companies have, they have approval bottlenecks, lack of insights into budgets, um, lost approvals, everything's offline, so there's a lot of redundant data entry in the real world, and uh, the system that we have addresses those types of challenges by providing an easy to use online requisition to spend interface, very flexible approval workflow with notifications so people can uh, review and approve requests to spend money based on parameters that you get to define, and this cre creates better compliance with various auditing protocols, better visibility over spending through a nice dashboard, which is also searchable and sortable, collaboration tools to communicate with one another regarding the status of the purchase request or the check request or the payment, and better um, savings of both time and money in connection with spending. And it does typically create an awesome return on investment and our integration with Sage 100 uh, differentiates us from anyone else because it's all tightly integrated with supplier lists, uh, general ledger account codes, budget codes, inventory items if you're using those so that you don't have to maintain that data in both systems. The kinds of workflows we're really looking to accelerate and improve are listed where Sage 100 master data gets set up, users go into Fraction E, and make a requisition, they submit that for approval. There's an option to check against the budget either at the project or at the GL code level, and the system will enforce your policies and procedures for spending, generating purchase orders where needed, and then ultimately you can do the receiving and the invoice matching against those approved POs, and that will all flow into the Sage 100 AP module or into the purchase order module depending on whether you're using uh, PO in Sage 100. Our solution is also scalable. We provide a number of modules as part of the bundled package, and most of them are listed here. There's some other ones as well that are not listed, but essentially we're looking at purchase requisitions, mobile or email approvals, POs. We can also do change orders if you need to modify a PO after the fact and need to get those changes approved. Invoice matching can be done in Sage 100 or in our system check requests, budget controls, and more. Uh, with that said, what I'm gonna do is pull up the application now by pulling up my web browser, and I'm navigating to the Fraction um, web application where I can log in as a person at my company who is interested in buying something or at least asking if it's okay to buy something. So we have multi-company support. It would typically be connected to a corresponding Sage 100C company, and that's what uh, syncs all the data back and forth. And now I logged in as a guy named Joe Requester in my company, and this gentleman Joe here has a dashboard where he can see any requests to purchase or to spend that are in progress. These are requests that he himself has initiated. Each one will have an internal tracking number. 
And the nice thing about this is that it keeps all of your non-Sage 100 users out of Sage 100 so that uh, you can keep requisitioners and approvers and even buyers outside of your AP system and GL system. Uh, in this case, there's friendly names here that the user can give to the transaction. For example, equipment or monthly supplies. That's just the title to go with the number. The name of the vendor, who do you want to buy it from? And that is uh, an approved vendor that came right out of Sage 100C but was available here. You can see the request type. People can categorize their requests by type, such as standard operating expenses versus computer-related IT requests. Some companies set up CapEx as a, as a type or non-budgeted or emergency requests. Any number of request types can be configured. A purchase request will create a purchase order once it's been approved. A check request or a, a payment request, once it's approved, will create an AP invoice. There's also visibility into the status of the transaction. What's the status of my request? Well, you made a request for equipment and it's in a status of waiting. That means it's waiting for approval. Well, who's it waiting on? It's waiting on manager Bob. When was it sent? Back on October 29th. So this manager got emailed, he got notified, and it's been sitting in his queue for a couple weeks. There's an out of office delegation feature, there's a proxy approval feature, and there's also a, no a notification of reminder feature. So there's lots of ways to ping this guy, manager Bob, to take action. And anybody who has access can log in and also see the status for good communication. There's other statuses such as require change where the approver or the buyer can send it back asking for changes to be made. You can also reject it or ask for more information and take other action. So we have visibility over the status. There's also a pending approval tab here. If I click on that, you'll see anything that's currently pending your approval. So for example, you can see there's one transaction that's currently waiting for my approval in my capacity as Joe requester, and it happens to be an invoice. But what happened there was um, someone, in this case the AP person, sent me an invoice to approve and it's waiting for my approval and it's been sitting here all year because I refuse to approve this invoice. Um, but normally that would get taken care of in a more expeditious, expeditious manner if the system was in production. There's also the uh, templates tab where you can see uh, any templates that you've created or that your administrator created. And this guy happens to have a monthly supplies template here for, for things that he orders on a monthly basis from his favorite vendor, Out Climate Maintenance. And it's a standard request type from the maintenance department. So if he happens to want to buy from his predefined template, he could just click this copy button and that will replicate the template into a brand new purchase order request. And it assigns a new requisition number. So you could see that requisition number there. All the line items that were on the template got loaded into a simple entry screen. And this person can simply put in the quantities for any line item that he wishes to um, purchase today or request to purchase. So maybe I'll just put a couple of quantities there on a few of those items. You can hit save and it will just save those items for which you've entered quantity. And it will navigate to what's called the review screen. So by using a requisition template, I have bypassed creating a requisition from scratch. If you do it from scratch, what you do is you set up your request header, you pick your department, you confirm your request type, you give it a name, and then you add your items, and then you confirm your shipping address, you review it, and it takes you back to this screen that we're on now. I just saved a little time by using a template here, and all the data got populated. The quantities, the cost, the extended total, it has a warning if it's gonna put you over budget, if you have set up budgets in Sage 100 at the general ledger account code level or at the job cost level. And I'll go ahead here and uh, just take a quick look at my GL code. If you click on the expense account, it'll pull up a report that will show you how much was budgeted uh, per period and for the fiscal year. It tells you what you've actually spent, what's been committed, total versus budget, and it shows you how much you're over or under and it turns red if it's gonna put you over budget. You can have approval 
uh, special approvals for those over budget requests if needed, or even hard stops. You can add comments. So you can add some kind of comment there if you want. That's just a, a, note of, a note that goes into the history. And you can also attach any kind of supporting information, such as pictures, specifications, quotations, contracts. Uh, I'll just go ahead and attach a, uh, a, a sample document here. I, I have a folder called attachments where I keep all my supporting information. And I'll just attach a contract so that my manager or the buyer has better idea of um, what the agreement will be with the vendor once we buy this. And then when I hit continue, it's going to calculate if anybody needs to approve the transaction. It looks at your approval rules at your company and it tells you who, if anyone, needs to approve it. This one happens to be $1,096 from the maintenance department. And because Joe Requester has very limited authority, it needs to go to his manager, Bob. But once Bob approves it, it also has to go to the director of finance because it's over budget. So you could configure those to automatically calculate based on parameters. And then after the director approves it, it goes to the purchasing coordinator bill to generate a PO and place the order. The system does support both centralized as well as decentralized purchasing. So you don't have to have a buyer at your company. It could just go back to Joe so he can order it once it's approved. Once the PO gets cut, it automatically will feed into Sage 100 as a purchase order so you don't have to rekey it. Unless you're not using the purchase order module in Sage 100, it just remains in our system and then later the invoice would be matched and then it would feed the invoice into Sage 100. Both flavors are available, PO integration as well as direct AP integration. So Joe has submitted that transaction for approval and he logs out. What happens next is a notification has gone to his boss, to the manager, Bob. So I'm just going to go to my email and I'm going to show you a sample notification that's gone off to the manager. This is a great email because Bob can actually just get it on his mobile device in his email and review it in full detail and then even look at the attached documents if there were any supporting informations and he can decide what he wants to do. And there's an option within the email itself to either approve it or reject it or ask for more information or for changes. And that just sends the action into the system without having to directly log in. Or he can click on the link in the email and it'll take him to his web browser, in which case he can log in from the full website. There's also a mobile interface for, for approvals that I'm not showing you at the moment, but uh, if, if I was on my mobile device, it would detect it and give me a more mobile friendly view of this of this screen. I've logged in as Bob Manager. Because I used the URL in the email, it's taken me directly to the transaction. And he sees that there's $1,096 worth of stuff being requested by Joe. There's a nice audit trail, a request history with a date and time stamp showing when it was created and submitted. And he could see that after he approves it, the director will also need to approve it. So here I'll just go ahead and say this is okay this time. Um, and you can approve it or you could take other action, rejection. If you need to modify it, you can edit it if you have rights. But in the interest of just wanting to move this along, I will approve it. It navigates manager Bob back to his dashboard. He has three transactions now pending his approval. And you could see there's a few other ones here which he can work on if he wants. They've been sitting here for a while. You could see the date that they got sent to him and he could go ahead and move those out or he could just come back later. So I've logged out as the manager after having reviewed and approved the transaction. And then it goes to the second approver. Her name is Jane Director. She has logged in. She can see this one transaction now pending her approval. And I'm just gonna go ahead and approve it right from the dashboard. So my second approver, got an email notification, she logged in and approved it, and now it's no longer pending her approval, and then it goes to the final approver. His name, uh, actually his name is Bill, and he's my purchasing manager. So I've logged in as Bill. Because he has rights to generate POs from approved purchase requests, they flow into his Create PO tab, and here you can see this monthly supplies request. It got approved on today's date, 
and he's just going to give it a final once over at this stage he sees the status is approved um, he, he could review all the information he could see the over budget status he could review the expense accounts the gl codes and he could see that it was approved by manager and director with their comments and that he's the final person he could see all the supporting information um, there is an option for him to either create a purchase order or a request for quotation if he wants to get quotes and there's other flexible options for this person i am going to create the po and place the order so that's the comment i've entered and i'm going to hit this button to create a po and it will get the next purchase order number from the system or from sage 100c and it will feed the po into sage 100 so um while it does that um I will go ahead and just pull up Sage 100 and then we'll be able to see the purchase order automatically created in real time. So uh, I pull, I'll pull up Sage 100 here. And if I go to purchase order entry, the most recent record will be that very same purchase order that just got created into Sage. So I'll just uh, click on the PO number lookup, sort by date, which uh, should get me close to today's date. There's November 13th right there. And you could see after I have clicked on that purchase order number, uh, we have this PO header with my comments, as well as the PO line item information for those items that were on that transaction. So that's the real time integration with Sage 100 that creates the PO. It happened to pr be purchase order 63. You don't have to go into Sage to see the PO though, because we have our own purchase order form. And I'll just go ahead and, um, click on my actually I've got a couple of windows open here one second while I make sure make sure I'm in the right place I'm gonna so what, what happens is once the PO gets cut in eRequester it moves into the receiving tab so it left the create PO tab and now it's an open purchase order in the receiving tab and you could view the PO by clicking on view PO here and it will pull up the actual transaction I'm just going to close the window in Sage as well. And uh, so once that PO comes up, you can actually print it or email it out of the Fraction E system. And there's a, there's a nice history on the transaction which shows uh, all the details about when it was created and submitted, when it was approved and by whom, as well as all the relevant details. You could do your receiving in, in Sage or you could do it through the E system. Thank you so much, Scott. And uh, Simon, please proceed with CertiPro. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, my name is Simon Quinn. I am the, rec the, the Director of Sales for CertiPro Solutions. Uh, today, I'm going to cover uh, CertiPro's Automated Inventory Cycle Count, or AICC. So, um, it's going to show you how to automate and simplify your inventory count. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of the concept. I'll then jump into Sage and show you the functionality. And then lastly, we'll cover some of the uh, reporting that is available to you. So using uh, cycle counting to maintain high levels of accuracy is one of the best ways to identify problem areas. An effective cycle counting program like CertiPro's AICC eliminates the need for physical inventory expenses. So by performing regular cycle counts, you give yourself an opportunity to compare the quantities in SAGE to the quantities counted. And this variance is a powerful opportunity uh, where you can identify where your inventory system is working well, where there's little variance, and where you may have, control, have a control issue that needs to be tightened up so there's a high variance happening. So if you notice that your numbers are way off, you now have an opportunity to find out why the problem is happening and take corrective action. So keep in mind, using regular cycle counts allows you to take corrective action more frequently. For example, if you perform monthly cycle counts, you now have 12 opportunities to fix problems versus one when performing annual physical inventory counts. So CertiPro's AICC is gonna configure all of this for you. An important difference between cycle counting and taking physical inventory annually, you know, by having your warehouse staff perform cycle counts of segments of your inventory regularly, you negate the need for shutting down your operations for a weekend or a period of time just to make your numbers, uh, make sure your numbers are correct. 
Now, of course, closing down your business for any period of time is going to be costly, and paying your employees overtime to perform physical inventory counts can add up as well. So this is what our automated inventory cycle count program can help you eliminate. You can imagine your day-to-day -day working life just being made easier by being better organized with a clearly defined logic to your inventory planning process. You'll have more time to focus on what really matters, as well as having less physical inventory expenses. So with that, I'm going to jump into Sage. And you'll see here on Sage 100 that we've created our automated inventory cycle count under inventory management, under the physical count, you'll see that once you acquire the software, we will install this module here, which is the CPS inventory cycle count entry. Clicking on this and opening it up, um, you'll see that this program is a single screen user interface. So it's very simple to use, very easy to manage. Uh, your warehouses are identified by codes up here, and you can scroll through the various warehouses if you have multiple warehouses with these arrows. Each warehouse, as you will see, is going to have its own schedule. You can configure what time you want to generate a cycle count per warehouse, and you can also set up email notifications by warehouse. So I'm going to go ahead and select a warehouse here. And I selected 000, so you can see that each of, of these three uh, grids populated. Um, so the top grid is the filtering section. Uh, the middle grid will represent the filtering choices and shows you what you have assigned into the cycle count intervals that I'll show you in a second. And the bottom is uh, the summary based on your setup. It, it will show you how many items per day you will be counting. So if we go up here and we go through the filter options, um, you'll see that I have all valuations, all product types, all procurement. And if I check or uncheck any one of these, you will see that the middle grid populates accordingly. You can also drill down here and look at uh, various other uh, fields to filter down. Um, so let's just say I want to look at items where the standard unit price is greater than $1,000. You'll see the middle grid, grid populates with those items. So now that um, once you filter down to the specific set of items that you want to take a look at or you want to adjust or uh, schedule account for, now you can actually go ahead and perform the update that's needed. So here, as I said earlier, I've already, uh, uh, I've already picked the items that are showing a uh, number of items that are greater than $1,000. So now I want to assign them to an inventory cycle category and define how many times I want them to be counted. But before I jump into that, I want to cover some of these acronyms up here, um, show you some of these abbreviations of what they mean. So YCC stands for yearly cycle count. So upon implementation or adding an item, each item is going to have a value of minus one, which means that you have not touched that item yet. So when you move it to zero, it means that you've added the item to be inventoried and to be counted. <clears throat> So you can also have a number from 1 to 52, meaning that you can assign an item to be counted once a week, once a month, or whatever interval you require. And the update's actually pretty simple. So let's just say I wanted to go ahead and uh, highlight all of these items that I have selected. I can now head down to the count frequency and assign a number. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and assign 12. We'll hit that 12 times. I could also type it in. Click on Assign, and you'll see that all of these, uh, uh, these populated uh, to 12. You can also uh, right click here and if you wanted to export these items to Excel and do any manipulation or uh, make any changes within the spreadsheet, uh, you can do that um, in Excel and then import it back in. So you have that flexibility with this uh, software also. Um, jumping back up to these abbreviations, the RC is a remaining count. So this is another powerful tool that allows you to set up items that are going to be discontinued. So we know that some items are not going to be in your inventory perpetually. So this basically allows you to define how many more times you want them to be counted. And once that falls off, if you set it for three and uh, three months later, um, the, the system will automatically uh, fall off the cycle process. It's going to update the YCC or the yearly cycle count to zero automatically. Um, these other ones here, FCNT is force count next time. 
uh, force count all the time and hold. So for hold, we know that in every warehouse, there's gonna be scenarios where you will pull certain items temporarily uh, to hold. And you don't want those items to be included in the count until the item is released back into inventory. So for force count next time, if you have a discrepancy and you want it to be resolved as soon as possible, the item in question might be scheduled for a count two months from now, but you don't wanna wait. So by checking this box, when you generate the count, um, it's going to be, uh, this item is going to be included. <clears throat> um, on the upper, uh, force count all the time is pretty self-explanatory. If you check that box, it's going to force count that item uh, every single time that account is generated. Jumping up to the upper right-hand corner here, we have the scheduler. And you will see that um, basically we're using the task scheduler from Sage 100. And here you can schedule the days of the week that you want to run uh, the cycle count. Uh, clicking on active warehouses, this will actually list the number of warehouses and how you want to manage them. Um, either have them, basically either have them enabled or not. And on the options screen, this gives you a number of different uh, options uh, that, uh, that impacts the system. So for example here, here we have all the email addresses for the warehouse staff that's going to receive the notification or the count sheets. Um, there's some other options here also. Um, that uh, basically roll over to YCC count from large to small is a pretty powerful one. Um, so let's just say that if you have your, your items ranked as A, B, or C, um, once all of the A items have been counted, it's gonna, be, it's gonna automatically pull the items from the B category to maintain the same number of items to be counted per day. There's also uh, exception days that you can schedule. So uh, clicking on the calendar here, you can select a uh, calendar, and these are basically gonna be holidays or vacation, vacation days. The holiday type will apply to all warehouses, and the vacation type will apply to a single warehouse. Now, while once you have the schedule and set up, uh, obviously the, um, the, the generation of the count is gonna be scheduled usually at 2 a.m. Uh, in the morning, so when the employees arrive in, um, it's going to be on their, it'll be in their uh, email box and they can get to work on doing the counts. Uh, but at any given time, you can also do a manual uh, generation if, if need be. So with that, um, let's go ahead. Once the cycle count has been uh, created, let's take a look at the spreadsheet that is delivered via email to the, assi to the assigned, <laughs> excuse me, the assigned warehouse team. So here you'll have uh, the breakouts of um, all the items that have been selected. You have the item code, uh, you have the description, you have the bin location. So this is compatible with multi-bin if you do have it. Um, and if you're using a scanner, this information will also be pushed directly to the scanner and you can go ahead and uh, do all the counts and verify all the counts uh, directly on the scanner itself. So this will uh, give, you, give the employee the information that's needed and they can go out and make those counts and note the quantity counted. So, um, <clears throat> go here. So now we're gonna go to the physical count entry program because once the count is done, um, we will go ahead and this will actually list all the items um, uh, that uh, need to be inputted and you'll, they'll put the counts put in here. So once, once the numbers have all been inputted and the, and the uh, cycle has been accepted and uh, all the numbers have been generated, um, <clears throat> you, you really wanna kinda know what's um, once the cycle has been run, you obviously want to know the results, you know, how accurate is my inventory? And so for that reason, we've created, um, uh, we've created an explorer that's called the CPS Inventory Cycle Count History. And this is the place where you'll find the items that not only have a discrepancy, but also all of the items that have been counted throughout the year that have been accurate. And here you can look into how many items have been counted each day, um, there's, uh, you know, what the, quantity, what the quantity counted was and any additional info. It's completely customizable. And for those of you that are familiar with Explorer, you can drag and drop fields and use filters to analyze the data. So you can obviously also export this to Excel. So with that, and in, uh, with the matter of time that we have left, I know there might be some questions and we hopefully will get to that at the end of this. Um, but I will hand this now over to Matt from Starship. Matt, over to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Simon.
Again, my name is Matt St. John, one of the sales executives here at B Technologies for Starship, and really appreciate everyone taking their time out of the day for our webinar. Um, so what I'll do is we'll walk through, I'm actually just going to process a shipment and show you the integration between Starship and Sage. Um, so on my screen now is uh, the Starship. This is actually our new web UI version. Uh, so as you can see, a nice new look and feel to the program. Uh, but with Starship, one of the nice features is as a shipper, I can actually just work inside a Starship. So technically, I don't need access to Sage. Uh, most clients on the shipping machines in the warehouse, they really just have Starship installed. And from here, I can, as you see, we can pull by sales order numbers, customer numbers, or even invoice numbers. My screen, I'm going to pull by sales order number. Uh, over here, as you see, we can get into applying different type of filters. We can search or sort by any of these columns here. Uh, we can get into, if we needed to, this group related order function where I can click the button and it's going to show me any orders that are all going to the same ship to or the ship via. And that way I can actually consolidate um, these orders into one shipment. So let me unclick that and we'll just again just pull a single order here. Uh, it's going to go over and we'll grab this one order. I'm going to click the truck icon and what Starship's simply going to do is bring in all the order header and line item detail from this order. Now in the upper left hand side here's the source. So this is what company I'm pulling the order information from out of uh, Sage. Now Starship out of the box does support multiple companies as well as warehouses and or of course locations. Uh, senders, again, it's just that sender information. Now with Starship, if anyone's doing drop ship, blind shipments, of course we can get into changing or even have Starship automatically changing the ship to account. And see here, I can set up multiple, you know, maybe this is a blind or drop ship. So you do have that options to help streamline your drop ship or blind shipments as well. And actually, let me just switch that back to the main. Uh, recipient, again, that's just pulling from the sales order, in this case, the ship to information. Now, Starship will also do address validation. We validate zip plus four, and also will, uh, based off of the carrier's database, uh, correct the residential commercial flag. Uh, so it can help save on those address correction fees, as well as that residential commercial correction fee. Right. Now, transportation, this with Starship, we're simply data mapping fields from Sage. Data map fields can have a one-to-many relationship. So here, based off the ship via Starship, automatically knows to select the carrier, the service, billing, billing account information. Anyone doing third-party or collect shipments, we can help streamline that where this can come in, automatically gonna select the third-party or collect option, and even populate the customer's account information automatically. Really, the name of the game with Starship is to help streamline your shipments. Uh, so even under shipment details here, so you're going to see uh, any of these fields, we can have a Sage field. We can look at those and have it automatically trigger any of these fields. Or, for example, here, the Quantum View Notify, I have it always defaulted and pulling in an email address. And my system set up that, hey, anytime there's a delay or an exception, use the carrier generated email. Okay, and I'll explain why my system set up that way in a little bit. Now down below, packaging line items. So from this packaging drill down, I can get into doing my item to box detail. Now with Starship, item to box detail is not required. And so if you do have a large order, you know you don't have to actually have your shippers put an item in each box. And one thing that's also going on in my system here with this blanket is Starship can automatically learn or we can mainly set up what we call packaging scenarios. So Starship knows, hey, every time they ship the blanket, they put it in a blanket box. So it's automatically packaged that for my shipper. Now, my other items, uh, no packaging scenario. So I just have my system set up, just drop them into a default package, um, which is the custom package. Now from here, I do have the option, I can grab items and maybe I know the pillow also fits in the blanket box. And then maybe these dinner plates, I'm just gonna drill down and I know they go into a small box. Now this drop down between the blanket and the small box, this is just Starship's database where you can set up and store your own custom packaging. And that can be bags, boxes, bales, pallets, what have you. But the nice thing with selecting or using custom packaging is um, it's gonna automatically populate the dimensions for your shipper. Now right here is the actual weight. So my system, I'm just pulling the weights from inside of Sage. Of course, if we had a scale hooked up, we can automatically grab the weights from a scale or I can manually type in the weights. Uh, 
But next door is the bill weight. So as you see, there's a difference and the bill weight is actually the dimensional weight. So nowadays between FedEx, UPS, even USPS, they do charge for dimensional weight. So Starship will do the correct calculation based off the carrier. And then when we send this out, it's gonna be sent out at the 19 pounds instead of the six. So gonna help save later on, you're not gonna get that fee where they're gonna say, oh, you sent that out at six, it should have been 19, here's the difference. So that's the packaging view. Also under the line item detail, uh, can drill down into this, see all the line items that I'm shipping. A nice thing with Starship is we also have a database for your inventory items. And we do this, you know, here in my system, item description, unit measure, you know, weights, all that's coming from inside of Sage. But with Starship's database, we can store information that might not live in Sage. So like the NMFC code or freight class, uh, especially this one being international. We have a whole database where we can set up and store uh, here the country of manufacturer, harmonize or schedule B codes. We have a lookup. So as a shipper, I can quickly come in here, you know, look up by code or by description, select it. And of course, once I ship this, Starship will automatically save that information for next time. So again, just helping streamline that, less things I have to click, fill out as a shipper, the better. Um, also, units on shipments, I can back order if I allow my shippers to actually back order items. And what Starship's going to do on the right back, we will automatically create the invoice inside of Sage. And of course, anything that I write uh, back order will be back ordered on that invoice. All right. um, so it shows you doing packaging under the packaging. We also have a, a packaging assistant wizard where I can have my items come in here and then simply drag or move over and select boxes on the right hand side. And then from there, I can simply click ship and process if I'd like to. I'm just gonna go back to the main screen and let me just button up some of these fields here. Now, the other nice feature of Starship is that we have integrations with over two dozen carriers and that's parcel as well as LTL. We also integrate with e-commerce sites and shopping carts like Magento, um, Amazon, eBay, so on and so forth. Uh, but with the carrier integrations, as you see, I can actually see my live negotiated rate that I have with the carrier. So from here as a shipper, I can maybe you know, select the least expensive. I can see published list rates and apply charges in Starship terms. That just means plus or minus any freight rules. Okay, now the, the whole rating process, that can be also automated. Well, you could set up a rule, a lot of our clients just do, hey, you know what Starship, you automatically rate shop my shipment and select the least expensive carrier service, for example. Now, under the total charges, I'm just gonna drill down in this. Um, here, what's going on is, as you can see, it's a, a different rate. So I have some freight rules set up. So with Starship, if, if you need to maybe add a, you know, a flat rate or maybe certain customers receive a discount or, hey, we're doing free shipping over X amount of dollars, uh, with the freight rules, we can accomplish that. So here I have one. It's actually just using at a, a looking at a custom user-defined field that I've set up inside of Sage. It's a simple checkbox called freight discount. So because it's selected, this customer is receiving a 10% discount. Now, freight rules can be percentages, min maxes, flat rates, and really these trigger fields or the uh, rules that we can look at uh, can go all the way down to line item detail. So I also have a rule here that says, hey, anytime this one item, which happens to be the plates, when they're on an order, automatically add $3 because their plates, they're fragile, so we use additional bubble wrap. So let's help cover that cost for the additional packaging material. Okay. So those are the freight rules. Now, when I'm ready to actually ship and process this, again, I can click the ship and process button. I can also go up under shipment. And as you see, we also have shortcuts, F3. So we also allow you to save shipments. But in this case, I'm going to do ship and process, or maybe I need to create a return label as well to give you all those different options. So here, just gonna click ship and process. And what Starship's automatically gonna do normally in my warehouse, I would have all my documents just print right out. Uh, just for the sake of this demo, I'm just gonna preview them. Uh, so first off, we'll get our shipping label and packing list. Now also for the demo, I'm using our smart label. And as you see, that will print a shipping label and packing list together. So this would need to go to a laser printer, but most certainly we can send our shipping label to a thermal printer or printers it's up to you you can you know we have clients that hey ups goes to a thermal printer over here and the fedex labels are a different size so they go to a different uh, thermal printer the packing list that starship can generate that can also go to a thermal printer if you like or of course you can send it to just a, a laser printer and print it on paper uh, our documents can be customized so here i just added a company logo 
unlimited templates for each of the documents. And then with each template, you can also get into assigning printing rules. So, you know, maybe customer ABC needs the packing list to look a little different, or maybe you are doing drop ships where the company you're shipping for needs to, you need to have their logo on the packing list. So you can create a template for that, assign a printing rule, and then of course Starship would only generate that document if that rule takes effect. Uh, so box one, box two, this being commercial invoice or international shipment, uh, we can generate all your international documents. So commercial invoice, as you can see, order header line item detail is going to automatically pop up. And this one I've customized so it's signed and dated. Again, one less thing the shipper has to do. I don't have to worry about signing that or dating it. And then also a NAFTA form. And it's the same uh, with uh, LTL shipment. Starship is multi-carrier, multi-mode. So you're going to be able to process all your different type of shipments right from Starship. So maybe I needed a bill lading form or a pallet label. Uh, Starship can also generate those as well. Okay. But again, normally we're just going to click ship and process as the shipper is going to get their shipping documents. And what would happen is just automatically take them oops, back to the main screen here where they can select their next order and kind of go through that whole process again. And real quick, what I'll do is jump onto my Sage machine so we can show you the right back. So I'm gonna go into SO invoice data entry. Here's sales order 222, the order we just shipped. Again, Starship's automatically created this invoice. On the header, I'm gonna to go to the tracking. Here's all my tracking information. So tracking numbers, carrier weight, so on and so forth. This is right inside Sage's tracking table so I can even use their little button to track. Or if I was doing item to box detail, I could actually see what was in each package. And then of course, totals tab, we're gonna write back the freight amount onto the freight amount field there. And that would be plus or minus any freight rules if we had those set up, or maybe you're already charged this um, for the shipment, you already charged the freight on the say the sales order. So we can also set up write back rules where we tell Starship, hey, in this scenario, do not write back or you know overwrite the freight amount. Okay. And then real quick, I'll show you a couple additional features that are included with Starship. Uh, one being if anyone has the requirement that, hey, at time of order, I need my sales reps to actually be able to um, rate quote. Uh, included with the program is we're going to add inside sales order entry the rate quote button. So let me do it quick here. So they can actually, just like inside Starship, click the rate quote button. They can even build the shipment if they like and then click rate and they would see all the different rates, okay? Um, and then also is our e-notify program where we allow you to set up your own custom email templates. So I'll grab the one that was just generated for the order. And here we go. So now this is why my system set up to only use the carrier generated emails if there was a delay because I'm sending the customers an email with my logo, it's branded my company, not UPS or FedEx. And these are very easy to create we can pull in Sage fields, again, item to box detail, hyperlink tracking numbers, and just like the printing documents, unlimited templates, and then you can also get into setting up uh, emailing rules as well. So maybe I only want this certain template with this promo code to go to certain customers. Again, create a simple emailing rule, and then Starship would only use that template in that situation. And then we also have our dashboard program. So uh, here we have dashboard, kind of our original dashboard where I have some matrix and of course canned reports, late delivery report, charge comparison report. And then actually now inside of the Starship web UI, we also have the dashboard program as well where I can drill down into this. And again, here's just some overview, some widgets I have set up. And then we've actually also added a heat map so you can see where all your shipments are going to. Again, really it's a brief overview. Uh, please feel free if you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one demo, more than happy to do that. Uh, again, thanks for taking your time. And AJ, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Thank you so much, Matt. I wanna thank you guys so much for presenting your solutions today.